And uh, how about just Tolu's uh, vulnerability? And um, bro, you're so special. We love you so much. Hey man, I appreciate you confessing all your horrible sin in front of us. And uh, but that's not. I, I, re, I can relate to that. You know, I, like I know I love God. I love Him with all my heart. I know because of the decisions I've made in my life. And yet, do I tell Him what I need to tell Him as much as I need to tell Him? So thank, thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate Nick showing those pictures of Glasgow. You know, we went. Uh, to Glasgow to encourage them. As Nick said, Mike and Marie Jarvis, uh, who are doing such a great job leading the church there, have already come down this year to serve us. And so have Chris and Suzanne Cashinard. And so we wanted to return the favor. And uh, uh, quite a little crew went from here up to Glasgow because we wanted to encourage them. You know, talking to Mike and Chris... They, they were sharing quite often, we love going down to Manchester because it gives us, as a little church, vision for what we can be. Now, you may feel like I feel. We told them, we feel like we're a little church, you know, down in, uh, here in Manchester. But, but when they're just, you know, so small, all that encouragement matters. And they had us going from... Friday when we arrived till Monday when we left. I think that's why some of us have come back a little under the weather. But th they asked us to do a devotional on Saturday morning. And this gets to what we're going to talk about today. They, they, they called together everybody in the church that just really wants to build the church in Glasgow for Jesus. Amen? Amen. And they said, please inspire us. We want to make a difference. And so... That's the title of the lesson today. Does anyone here want to make a difference with your life? You want to make a difference for God? Well, that, that's how we feel too. I want to read a quote to you though. And this quote is by Martin Luther King Jr. It says, Human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires, are you ready? Sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. So again, should I ask, who wants to make a difference? <laughs> because what it's going to require is sacrifice. Can you relate? Suffering, struggle. He goes on to say, the tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. It's not easy, is it? Walking this path following Jesus, it's not easy, is it? Can anyone relate? And yet we want to follow Jesus. Please turn to 2 Timothy. Come on, Chris. We're going to read to you, uh, the, I'm going to read the entire chapter of 2 Timothy. This is what we read Saturday morning at the devotional in Glasgow. And you know, just an encouragement for your family groups and your Bible talks. It, it, it's, it was so awesome to read this passage and then to hear what everyone else saw in the passage. I wish we could do that today and hear from you, but that's, that's meant for a smaller setting. So I'll do my best to share my heart with you. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, but mark this, there will be some kind of maybe not so easy times. Is that what it says? No. There'll be some difficult times. Is that what it says? No, Paul says there will be terrible times in the last days. He goes on to define that, verse 2. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, 
disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far, because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Verse 10. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured. Yet, the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, Timothy... Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you've learned it and how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. Amen. Okay, just a light little passage to get things started today. <clears throat> Obviously, it's a lot easier to get up and share the fun, good scriptures. But Paul was trying to teach Timothy here some very valuable lessons for life. And... In the first nine verses, he's warning him there are going to be terrible times in the last days. Now, if you're wondering, what are the last days? Are those the days right before Jesus comes back? Well, I don't believe so, because he warns Timothy right then and there to have nothing to do with such people. So the inference is that the last days have already begun. And so... It's my understanding that the last days simply referred to all those days from the time Jesus came to show us lightness in the dark, to die on the cross for our sins, all the way to the second coming of Jesus when he will come to judge the living and the dead. Those are the last days. And the first nine verses are all about warning us there won't just be tough times. There'll be terrible times. And, you know, I think a lot of times we want to be positive and think, oh, we don't live in terrible times. But we do live in terrible times. And, you know, if you look at this, it's not just talking about terrible times in the world. We know that's true. Just this past Thursday in Moss Side, about a mile and a half from where I live, a 17-year-old boy was stabbed to death. We live in terrible times. But that's in the world. 
What Paul is warning Timothy about is there will be terrible times even in the church. Because he says there will be a form of godliness, but denying its power. Are you with me, guys? And so I grew up going to church. And my heart here is not to insult anyone. We're all sinners. Has anyone committed any of those sins we just read? Lovers of self, anyone? Lovers of money? Boastful? Proud? Yeah, I see a lot of hands. And the rest of you, you you can be forgiven for lying. Amen. (laughs) Just kidding. We're all sinners. This isn't saying there's bad people and good people. There's sinners, but then Jesus came to call us out of this, to forgive us of our sin. Look at Acts chapter 2, please. Come on, Chris. Come on, Chris. Luckily, in the second half of the chapter, uh, Paul goes on to telling us how to escape those terrible times, how to overcome those terrible times. And how to defend our faith in a hostile world. Amen? In Acts chapter 2, verse 36. There's a summation, and you can go back and read the whole chapter for for the full context. But in Acts 2, 36, Peter says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent, change, turn from these ways and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Why are there terrible times? Sin. Sin. That's why there are terrible times. It's that simple. This is a list of sins. Jesus came to forgive us of our sin. The thing is... We cannot really appreciate the good news of the gospel that God doesn't want to count our sins against us until we understand what our sin has done. How sin destroys. That we are sinners. No, we haven't just made a few mistakes. We've sinned. And our sin nailed Jesus to the cross. So that we must be cut to the heart and say, brothers, what do we do? And then we're called to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Reading on. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children. For all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, follow me. He warned them. And he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Do you see it? Terrible times. It was a corrupt generation then. It is a corrupt generation now. We cannot fall for Satan's lie that everybody's really basically good. We can't fall for that lie. We're not basically good. We're sinners. But God has come to forgive our sin. Those who accepted the message were baptized. About 3,000 were added that day. Why are there terrible times? The answer, the answer is sin. I've got three things I want to give you today that... All of us need. Even you. You're not an exception. Every one of us need these three things if we're going to escape the terrible times. And 
if we're going to have any chance of helping others escape these terrible times. Amen? Amen. Number one, indignation. You need indignation. Do you have indignation? Do you know what it is? It's not a word we use often, is it? Indignation is anger aroused by something unjust. Have you ever felt that? Okay. Let me read you something I read in the Mank. The Mank. Right? The News of Greater Manchester. Here we go. The title of the article, Just Leave Us Alone. Kind of expresses indignation, doesn't it? A popular restaurant in Ancoats has shared a gut-wrenching statement after being hit by a fourth break-in. The blue-eyed panda has been the victim of multiple break-ins over the years, each time leaving them with costly repairs. And the blue-eyed panda has once again pleaded with those who are breaking in to just leave us alone. They're pleading. This Chinese favorite has been able to remain open for business as usual, but told its followers were very angry, were very frustrated to have been targeted again. They write, to the guys who like to visit us out of hours. <laughs> Yesterday, April 1, we were happy to celebrate our fifth anniversary at the Blue Eyed Panda. Hooray! Today, 6.15 a.m. April 2nd, you, all caps, yes, you, decided to break into our restaurant again. There's six exclamation points. I think that's indignation. Every time you guys come in, you get nothing. We say it again. We do not keep valuables or money in the restaurant. We've also eaten all the cake from last night. <laughs> Thanks to you, we have to do repairs again. Please stop. All caps. We have enough pressure already, day and night. Do you know how difficult it is for local family businesses at the moment to be alive in this industry? Do you know how many staff are depending on this restaurant and its job to feed their families? Of course you don't. Please just leave us alone and let us breathe. Many exclamation points. That's indignation. And you know, I find that it's easiest to have indignation when the sin has been committed against you. <laughs> when you feel the pain of the sin is when it's easy. But we've got to learn to have indignation about our own sin. Don't we, church? Amen. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Preach, Chris. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, Paul's talking about godly sorrow. He says this, he says, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah. To have godly sorrow, to change and to have no regret because you're forgiven. But worldly sorrow brings death. Verse 11, see what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness. To clear yourselves. What indignation. Do you see it? I didn't just make this up. This is something God wants us to have. And we will have when we have godly sorrow and see sin for what it is. We live in a very tolerant society, guys. And we want to show grace and mercy. But we should not tolerate what God calls sinful. Not in our own lives, in the church. Or in others. Are you with me, guys? Yeah. What alarm. What longing. What concern. 
what readiness to see justice done. I want to repent. At every point, you proved yourself innocent in the matter. I'm ready to change. When someone has that attitude, can you recognize it? Yeah. Oh, you can recognize it. And so can God. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I promise you the last two points are way shorter. <laughs> you got it? I want to read this one because it really struck me. 1 Corinthians 15, 30 to 34. Paul is kind of sharing his heart here. And he says, and as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? Why was Paul endangering himself? By preaching the gospel to people. He wasn't endangering himself for any other reason but to proclaim the truth. He says, I face death every day. Verse 32. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? Wild beast they made him fight. Why? Persecution for preaching the gospel. There'll be no advancement automatically or inevitably without suffering and struggle. Are you with me? If the dead are not raised, let us drink, eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Right? Paul's making an argument from the world. Hey, if there really is no Jesus, there's no resurrection, we're not striving to be resurrected. Let's just eat and drink and enjoy. But see, Paul did believe all those things were true. And so he wasn't going to do that. He says in 33, here it comes. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses. Do you hear it? As you ought. Do you hear it? And stop sinning. It's a call to repentance. And then this line gets me every time. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Paul's saying, we get so caught up in the world and in sin, and we, we, don't have, we don't have indignation, so we end up hanging with bad characters that influence us. We end up watching bad character things that influence us. Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. And then we spend our time in sin, and, and that's just not in complete evil things. Not doing the good we know we ought to do is what? Is sin. And then here's the, the toughest rebuke almost I can hear. There's people out there that don't know about God. They're ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Whoa. What's he saying? He's saying, you guys, you Corinthians, you know the truth and they don't. Shame on you. And I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to anybody else. It's so easy to sink into lukewarmness yeah. and fear and not face death all day long. Indignation. Let me go on to number two. Inspiration. Inspiration. We all need it. If we're going to escape those terrible times... First, we need, we need indignation that it, what's wrong yeah. Yeah. and what we need to flee. But then we need inspiration to flee from it. Yeah. And that's where Paul says, Timothy, you know me. You know I've sinned, but you know I've, what I've repented of and, and what I'm striving, my purpose, my faith, etc., etc. And yes, of course, persecutions come. It's not easy. You know what happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. Timothy was from Lystra, so yes, he knew what happened to Paul there. And many of you can tell your stories. Maybe you will in fellowship. What, what happened to you here, there, and somewhere else because of standing up for the truth and not having a form of godliness and denying its power. Paul says, but as for you, Timothy, continue in what you've learned and become convinced of. We have to learn, don't we? And we have to become convinced. 
Because you know those from whom you've learned it. Who is he talking about? Well, he could have been talking about himself. But he also could have been talking about Timothy's grandmother and mother. Because earlier in the book, it tells us that they taught him the scriptures. They passed on their sincere faith to Timothy. You know, in the Jewish religion, you start to formally learn the scriptures at age five. But obviously his mother and grandmother had started way earlier than that. From infancy, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. So we need inspiration, don't we? Who inspires you? Timothy had Paul. Paul inspired him. He said, Timothy, run away from all that. And Paul didn't shy off telling him about the terrible things. Telling him what to avoid. And then saying, but here's... The example I'm striving to set, now you follow it. That's inspiration. What inspires you? You know, I just got to talk about the singing in the church lately. It's been inspiring, hasn't it? I mean, I've been inspired. And even uh, cherished. Wow. What a voice God has blessed you with. And thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, the way she sang here a few weeks ago. Um, and even at the funeral on Friday. And I don't know if the other, I don't know if you've seen the video that's circulating, but I think Anthony Bullagoon did it. I mean, he does most of the videos, but <laughs> there's a video of us singing Men Who Dreamed a few weeks ago. And Tolope is singing that opening uh, part way up in the stratosphere. And she hits that note. And the videos from way back up top, and Dave Matazzi and Ivy are in the video. <laughs> and Tolalapi hits that note. Whee! <laughs> right? A lot better than that. And she gets stronger and stronger. And Dave Matazzi says, Yeah! <laughs> Punch it! <laughs> really loud. And then Ivy starts dancing. Can I just tell you, that's how it ought to be in church. Yes. If we get inspired everywhere else, we need to get inspired in church. Yes. Yes. And when yes. men you can clap. I think sometimes we're so afraid to clap or show any, anything that we're inspired. But we do it at the football match. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we're so afraid of culture. Yeah. Man, I'm telling you, when, when someone uses their talent, it inspires us. The most inspired thing we have here today is the inspired Word of God. Yeah. That should incite us and bring us out. D.L. Moody said, I know the Bible's inspired because it inspires me. And that's where when we get in the Word, it makes a difference. And I want to tell you, don't be afraid to show it because you know why? That inspires others. If others can't tell, are they inspired by this? Are they not inspired? Should I be inspired? Should I not be inspired? That's a problem. Are you with me? Yeah. We want to make a difference. We need to be inspired and we need to inspire others. That's why we went to Glasgow. That's why Nick is taking a group today and Nick's going to be preaching in Leeds this afternoon. Because we want to inspire that smaller church up there in Leeds. And on May 12th, God willing... Many of them will be here and we'll be all together, and that'll inspire us. I got to tell you about something. On Mother's Day, we went out to lunch for Mother's Day with Dorothy. Dorothy's not here, right? I think Dorothy is probably with Levi and Keisha. They had to go to the church they're getting married in today. Do you know why? I never heard of that. Well, I heard kind of. But today is the reading of the bands. Yeah. Do you have to do it? So I didn't know this still existed. But I guess when you're going to get married in a church, there has to be this reading of the bands. Yes. And I guess anyone that feels there's some legal reason you shouldn't be married, that's the time to speak up. So they've had to go over there today. They're going to try to come. 
But they've had to go over there today for the reading of the bands. So pray no one shows up <laughs> with a vendetta. But we went to Mother's Day with Dorothy and Levi and a friend of his he's grown up with and uh, a few others, Keisha and Anisha, I think, was there. Teresa and I. And Dorothy, Dorothy says in front of the table, pointing at Levi's childhood friend, we want to Christianize this man. <laughs> and like, well, maybe that's not the best way to kind of break things open. You know, you know, some of you know, <laughs> But Dorothy had a relationship with this young man. He didn't, he didn't flinch. He knew it was coming. Because that's just Dorothy. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that's how you ought to do it. But are you afraid to say what you really mean? Come on, Chris. Come on, Chris. I know we got folks here studying the Bible. We want to Christianize you. Yes. We do, not for our sake, for the sake of Christ. That's right. We we want to be Christianized, right? Young Christians, old Christians, we want to stay Christianized. I don't know if it's anything like pasteurized, but you know what I mean. <laughs> well, this this young fella quipped back, No, I'm a hard top. And Levi looked at me and said, do you know what that means? And I did know what that means because I've thought of the pun before. And I said to him, you mean you're not convertible? <laughs> and he said, exactly. So we have to pray for the softening of that hard top. Amen? But we've got to have inspiration. And I want to tell you, as disciples of Christ, we may not always feel like it. I'll be honest, I didn't feel like it today. And it wasn't just my physical sickness. There are a lot of things going on that made it a struggle to come and, and, and give today. But, but that's my commitment to God. And so that's what I'm going to do. And I want to call you to do the same. And that's the third point, really. The third point of all this, and I believe this is the cheat code. Right? You want a cheat code? You want to know how, what's the easy way to do all this? The third one is imitation. Indignation. You need it. If you don't have it, you won't stay away from the things you need to stay away from. You know, bad company corrupts good character. But often I tell you I believe the reverse, which is what? Good company. Good company corrupts bad character. That's where the inspiration comes and then calling for imitation. Look at 2 Timothy. We'll close there. We're all in this together, guys. Conversations are such an amazing way to inspire people. Especially when we use the inspired word of God that can teach us, correct us, train us. And even rebuke us when we need it. In righteousness. And that's why Philemon says, I pray you'll be active in sharing your faith. So that you'll have a full knowledge of everything you've been given in Christ. Kind of like Toller's letter I did. You know, when, when he said, oh, I'm going to write this letter. He started, oh my gosh, I, I really do love my mom. <laughs> I really do love my mom. That's, that's more like it, right? And so as we share our faith in what God has done. And our gratitude to God with other people. And we use his word to do it. That reminds us. That inspires us. We hope it inspires them. But then there's a call. There's a call. 2 Timothy 2. We'll start in verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. And trust to reliable people. You will also be qualified to teach others. So Paul doesn't just try to give Timothy indignation and inspiration. He calls him to imitation. It's like, you know what you've seen me do? And what you see me say in the presence of many? Yeah, you do that too. And find people that will then do it like you do it. And it's not about us. It's about the message. Amen? Imitation works. People imitate the worldly way of life, don't they? They see drinking and they drink. They see drugs 
They see sex? You, are you with me? Morgan Brittany said, Hollywood has an obligation to watch what they put out there. Kids do imitate what they see, good or bad. Think Hollywood's listening to Morgan, whoever she is? <laughs> no, they're not. Not by, by and large. Beauvais said, example has more followers than reason. We unconsciously imitate what pleases us and appropriate to the characters we most admire. That's why a bunch of young people go toward what's really popular. And if they feel like church in the Bible is boring, guess what they won't gravitate toward? Church in the Bible. It's up to us not to make it boring. Are you with me? And that requires overcoming the fear of what they're going to think about it and just having a good old time in your own Christianization. Are you with me, church? And that's what... Being in Glasgow was so awesome. Friday night, we were in the Weatherspoons in City Center, and the table started with about four or five of us, and it ended with 20 plus. And a number of our young folks were there, and their young folks and some guests, and it was so big and so loud, we couldn't even have one Bible discussion. So another brother had to step up, and there were two Bible discussions on each end, and I couldn't even hear the one hardly on my end. But we were doing it, and it was, it was, there was a fire to these young people. A sister told my wife recently, I remember years ago, praying because there was nobody in this church between the age of 20 and 30, yeah. and now there are so many. Yeah. Guys, God will answer. Yeah. We've just got to make sure we have indignation and inspiration, and that we're not afraid to say, man, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Come on, let's go. Every one of you need a Timothy. Or a Timolape. Timothea. <laughs> In your life to pass this on to. Because it'll revive your faith and God willing their faith and they'll have someone to pass it on to. I'm going to close with this. Um, Paul said, but as for you, continue in what you've learned. And become convinced of. Because you know those from whom you learned. And of course. That related to the holy scriptures. That's what they learned. We think of. Timothy's mother. And Timothy's grandma. I want to thank all of you that came to support. Nathan. And the Chinese ministry. As we laid our dear sister Anne to rest on Friday. All the things that were shared were so moving about Anne. What a wonderful woman of God. And I particularly thought, Nathan, what an absolutely amazing job Nathan did eulogizing his mother. Sharing about who she was and vowing who he wanted to be and that he would see her in heaven one day. And these scriptures just come to life for me. That's like Timothy's mom teaching him. And on behalf of the entire Manchester church, I know you will agree with me. I, I wanted to share with our wonderful Chinese ministry how blessed we've all been that God chose to bring them to be a part of us here. Yeah. And I'll say it again, your love your humility, your heart to serve, the respect you live your lives with. We've all benefited and will continue to benefit from those things. And as so many shared on Friday, Anne embodied all those things. And we're going to miss her, but she's in a better place. And I'm so grateful for the inspiring life she's left behind for us to imitate. So let's close in a word of prayer. We'll have one more song. Don't forget your children and have some great fellowship. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. God, I pray that you will in some way 
help everyone that leaves here leave with something, whether from your word or the message or the communion or the songs or fellowship that will help them to escape these terrible times. God, help us as a church to escape these terrible times, to defend our faith, God, and to, to be the inspiration that people need to see your love and to embrace that love. God, I, I pray for all the things I don't even know about, all the needs I'm not aware of in the church. I know you're aware of them, Father, and you're striving to minister to them. And I just pray that your spirit and all the disciples here will be alive and no matter what we're going through, that we'll, we'll be able to pass that faith on, remind ourselves, and enlighten someone else. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for one more song.